Good morning. A very warm welcome to all of you out there. This is SEMIC 2020 and you are part of it the whole day, I hope. Actually, we are here the whole day. We are coming to you from a studio in Brussels, as you just heard. It's a cozy and warm place because outside the morning was chilly and fresh, so we are very warm here and nice. And we hope that you are the same over there, wherever you are, all over, over Brussels. My name is Max. I'm your moderator today. I try to help you and us and me in particular uh, throughout the day. Uh, I'm very sorry for that. Uh, bear with me, but I try to stay outside because we have a huge chunk of interesting things for you lined up that I hope you already clicked your way through and pre prepared your sessions. This is SEMIC 2020, fully online this year. You know, you know why, we don't go into all the details. The topic is sustainable data services. And every word counts in that, sustainable. Sustainable data, sustainable data services. Uh, and as I said, we tried to, to bring you a whole bunch, a whole array, a nice uh, menu of interesting events and discussions and thought-provoking issues today to you. And the team behind had three threads, three particular little red lines that we thought we would love to bring to you today, suggest to you, discuss with you, test them with you all through the day. The first point that I need something for you. Do you know what this is? Can I can come closer? It's a wrench. It sounds nasty, but it is a fantastic, useful tool. It is something that helps you fixing things, preventing that things break. Well, then if they are broken, you have to repair it. I think it's a wrench in English. It's a clé anglaise in French. I don't know why the French call it uh, English. And in German, it's called a Rohrzange. This sounds a bit brutal, but it actually does what you, uh, what you expect from it. It prevents things from breaking in the piping, in the inner settings of a house. And if ever they break, you use this to repair it. So this is the first point that is like a red thread for us during the day. It is preventing things from breaking, maintaining things in function, and if yet they break, then we use the tools, our brains, to get the things going again and to build the next generation of tools on top of it. So maintenance, repair of broken things. That was the first point. The second of this was that in digital services, in public services, things happen where the people are, where I am, where you all over there are. Uh, where the companies work, where the offices are, where I need to go to get things done. This is the local level. So we have a big focus on the local level, on the people, on the businesses that should be well served by public administrations. This was a second point. Again, you need good tools for doing that. And then we had a third point that mattered for us. And let's see whether it matters as well for you. This is the community. Because you're not alone in these things. You can't really do it alone. We as a team here, and you should see the, the nice crew here in the studio, we can, none of us can do it alone, but as a team, we are great and good at inventing, at pre uh, repairing, at preventing things from breaking. So three things, maintain and repair, the second, the local level, the user focus, and the third one, uh, the community. And the community brings me to, to a sad point. I said already, everybody knows it. All the things these days are not physical unfortunately. So we are fully online. It's the first time that we are fully online. And you know that always things can happen. Things can break down and we try to repair it. So bear with us should ever things, uh, things break. But we think that if we miss the buzz of sitting in a big room, in a crowded room together, discussing, bumping into colleagues and discussing and exchanging, uh, we can't do that now. So please, you from your comfortable chairs and offices and sofa saloons, and I don't know where you are, um, you create the buzz, engage with us, with your audience, with your colleagues around all over Europe and actually around the world. Do that, you can do that with a number of tools. The first one is, you will see on the right side of your screen, uh, a Slido embedded function. This is sort of the chat that we're using throughout the conference. Make your points there, ask questions, come in, say yeah, great or bad, uh, like, like you feel like, and maybe we should just as a typical warmer, try to do this already now through a test. 
So I would love to ask the colleagues in the Regie to display a first poll on Slido and ask you to come in and tell us what you think about it. I think it will take a moment to appear. But the question that we thought we wanted to ask you this morning is what motivates you? What drives you? Of course, today, in this chilly morning, at least here in Brussels, what drives you to get out of bed? Maybe you're still in bed, actually. You can do that. I can't do that. We can't do that. But great if you do. So what drives you? What motivates you in life or today? Tell us in the Slido chat, and you will see the word cloud appearing uh, as, as you're typing. Uh, the colleagues told me that it will take a few seconds to appear, but still, so start typing. Tell us what drives you today. But that's not the only way uh, how you can engage with, uh, uh, with us and with the colleagues all over the world today. Um, there is, of course, Twitter. CEMIC 2020. This is today's hashtag. Please speak about it. Tell the outside world why it is fun here. If it is fun here, we hope you. If you're hearing something interesting, if you meet interesting people. Uh, and I see actually one of the big thing already here coming on the Slido is curiosity. Tell us about it. Tell the world about it. So tweet about it. Ask throughout the day questions in Slido. This is in particular interesting during the parallel tracks and the breakout groups where we want to have a lively discussion. In smaller groups, it's sometimes uh, better, but we will use it also for the keynote afterwards. Then don't forget networking. There is a networking function that is part of the, the platform. Use it. There is also the possibility to do one-on-one -on -one checks. Ask people to discuss and see and do as if there was no COVID out there, sort of. Mm -hmm. Another area that is very interesting in the more social buzz uh, part of an, of an day-long event is the an, uh, expo area. We have no exhibition really live happening, but there is an online exhibition I've seen in the morning coming in here that lots of people were already moving out, so check it out during the whole day, please. Uh, I discussed with colleagues uh, in the morning and they said, imagine we have around 600 registrations for the day. That's fantastic. I think this is more than we had in the past. Let's see how many stay during the day. We try to make our best that they stay. But another element that I like about this is that we have around 50 countries represented. So this is, of course, Europe, but this is the immediate neighborhood like North Macedonia, Albania, Montenegro. This is Georgia, Ukraine, and we go to Africa, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Burkina Faso, and we go to Vietnam and Australia. Isn't this fantastic? The whole world is sort of sitting around CEMIC 2020, and this proves for us also an important point that when we say community, we don't say it ends at the EU's border. We are ready and open for a community all across the globe that is gathering around values-based digital administrations. Okay, let's see now where we are with the cloud. I have a monitor here where I can see, wow, I love it. Curiosity, big in the middle, love, learning. Of course, coffee, that's something that is very important also for me. Creating a better world, fulfillment is a smaller one, open source, I like it. Providing happiness, friends, positive change. This gives me superb vibes, actually. Uh, for the day, uh, and I would love to have, a, if I can have it as a, a screenshot, I would love to put it on my, on my um, office monitor once I come back to the office, but I can take it with me there. Thank you very much for this. Maybe we can come back to this picture from time to time and somebody maybe can, can tweet it. This picture, curiosity, positive change, love, innovation, interoperability, ambitions, is also something that I know matters a lot for my colleagues in the Commission. And this goes up to the very, very top of the Commission. Uh, and I'm very pleased to, to use this to move over to the opening welcoming speech of uh, Commissioner Hahn, um, who is the member of the European Commission in charge of the budget, big thing these days, today is the European Council, um, uh, and the negotiations are going on every day, in charge of the budget, of the administration of the Commission. And he wants to make the European Commission itself the most digital, data-driven, powerful organization going out to the people, opening up uh, to the citizens of Europe. Uh, but he's also in charge of public administrations. And he is in a good place for that because he was the Minister for Research and Science in Austria. Then he was the Regional Affairs Commissioner. He knows what matters for the local level that we said. And he also was the Commissioner for the Neighborhoods, opening up Europe to partners uh, around Europe. So, please. If you are seated, be seated, please, and listen to uh, what Johannes Hahn tells you at the opening at the CEMIC 2020 conference.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be with you to open the 10th CEMIC conference. First, allow me to start by thanking the German presidency for organizing this event with us and for the focus and drive you have injected into the interoperability agenda. Today, it's the first time that the CEMIC conference has gone fully virtual. Now, you may rightly say, This is not surprising given the circumstances, but it's nevertheless a reminder that it's uh, thanks to digital tools that we are managing to keep our businesses going and growing and our discussions open and alive across the European Union. Digital has been at the forefront of a new reality in Europe and all over the world. We have seen record rates of adoption of new technologies and new ways of working at the base considered impossible just a year ago. We have just announced the digital decade for the European Union. It will be underpinned by monumental investments into 5G, artificial intelligence, high-performance computing, data infrastructures, digital skills and digital public services, to mention but a few. Today's tools and solutions will be replaced by new ones. But within this whirlwind of change, one thing remains constant, and that is the need for interoperability. As the ISA Square program transitions into the Digital Euro program, data interoperability remains so high on the European Union policy agenda that just a few weeks ago it was underlined in the conclusions from the meeting between our European heads of state and government. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is where you come not just onto the stage, but to the forefront of it. CEMIC is all about the communities, which continue defining and maintaining semantics and data models, who keep them valid as time and technologies change. The CEMIC community is essential to providing business continuity and resilience in today's complex world. Semantics are one of the central components in the data spaces, which we are currently developing. Semantics provides the necessary glue to ensure interoperability within and across sectors. We need the continued support from you and your network of experts across the Union, in particular in the areas of health, justice, environment and employment. Because the reality is that there is much more to digital sovereignty than hardware and software. Despite being in the area of self-driving cars and smart fridges, agreeing on how we want to exchange data is not something technology will do for us. Data and technologies are like any other tools. They will only be as good and useful as the minds that define them and the hands that hold them. If we want to foster innovation with self-driving cars and smart fridges, we also need to agree on basic rules regarding public security and food safety. Semantics and data models that must reflect our European values. Building consensus on semantics and data models is an effective and efficient way forward to deliver better digital public services for European citizens and businesses. Today, your discussions will help us achieve this. And on this note, I would like to thank you for the important work you do for the European Union and I wish you a fruitful conference. Johannes Hahn, thank you so much. I think this was a very encouraging word of uh, clear commitment from the very top of the European Commission for an an open collaborative digital transformation project. Uh, and because it's like that, it's also a very clear call to all of us, all of you out there actually to get the sleeves up and rolling. But it is in particular, and so this is maybe the, the move then to the, to the next agenda point that we are waiting for. It is in particular a move to the chief information officers who are in the first front Uh, of this collaborative project uh, across the member states. And uh, you know that there is this network of G CIOs of the member states across Europe. And I'm very happy to have two of them today here with us. 
opening uh, this uh, SEMIC 2020 conference with us. The CIOs are, th are at the forefront, and uh, as we said, they are feeling the heat uh, with their teams most. I don't know whether we see them appearing here, but I'm very happy to have with us today Markus Richter, who is the CIO of the Federal Republic of Germany, co-organizer of this event today, the acting presidency of the uh, Council of the European Union. He is the CIO and State Secretary uh, of, uh, uh, in the Federal Ministry of the Interior. I see him here with us from his office in Berlin. Hello, hello, Markus. Good morning. Great that you are here. He has a great reputation, actually, as a modernizer in the, Europe, in the, the German government uh, setup, going through many interesting key steps there. And now he is the man, the CIO at the head of his team, with whom we are actually working very, very well together. So many thanks for that. Uh, the second participant in the, this opening Q&A session is Mario. Hello, Mario, who is with us uh, this morning from his office uh, in the center of Brussels in DG Digit. He is the acting DG of the Commission's own IT department, so he's sort of the equivalent to Markus, uh, what Markus does for, for Germany, uh, uh, Mario does for the European Commission itself, so he's sort of the CIO or the CTO whatever you like. And for him, the same attributes like for Marcus play uh, a human face, a human power and energy and very inclusive for the both of them. So it's fantastic to have, uh, have you here. Mario has spent uh, uh, a fantastic career in the Commission in innovation, research, practice uh, and now operations uh, and policy. Uh, so welcome to the two of you here. And uh, let us maybe start, as we said, it's still a little bit in the morning, in particular for various parts of Europe. Uh, with a more personal question to the two of you. You may be the big bosses of big important administrations and offices, uh, but you are like us, confronted with lockdown, sitting at home, living through the home office. Would you have a little anecdote to share with us how it was during the lockdown? Was there anything that broke? Anything that you had to go down to the basement in the engine room and repair it? Do you have an anecdote for us? Uh, can be funny, it doesn't need to be always successful. Life is not always successful. Markus, will you start? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, let me think about it because we've got some, we, we went through so much. Uh, I had one experience. Um, I was right in negotiation with representatives from the states within Germany, and it was quite complicated, I've, I've got to say. And I usually or often do video calls over my mobile phone. And right in the heart of a debate, uh, my telephone rang and my kids were on it. And uh, instead of clicking them away, I let them in the, the video conference and they immediately started to talk about gaming and their last success in these uh, games and I couldn't stop them <laughs> and it was quite hard to get uh, yeah, to, to finish this um, because everyone was listening to them and it was quite funny uh, so yeah I can there's a lot to say <laughs> that's cool I love it I think there's lots of uh, people in the audience who share this Mario anything from your side Good morning, everybody, and good morning to the whole world that is with us. I'm so happy to be here, and nice to see you, uh, Marcus, and uh, and I'm, I'm really enjoying this this open conversation. Yes, I mean, uh, during, during the lockdown, well, first, I, I don't know if, if, if I work from home or if, if I actually slept in the office. It's, it has been always this kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, question, existential question. But I remember that I kept um, um, a regular uh, conversation with all the colleagues in Digit. And one day I decided to make it from the, uh, from the garden uh, because, uh, you know, I think that was a, a human touch on that one. You know what? I think that everybody remembers more the sound of the birds than what I said. So, <laughs> so that's those small anecdotes that make us laugh when we go back, although the times are tough and rough for all of us. But you're, you're right, both of you. Thanks for, thanks for that. So you are human, we are human, and it is this human uh, community that brings us forward. I love it, both of the examples. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing. But maybe to come back to, so these experiences, something that has broken sometimes, some life that breaks into, into, our, uh, into the daily, daily business. You as CIOs, I imagine, you have also seen a great number of cool projects, unexpected projects, spontaneous projects, community NGO projects, uh, where a few folks have take, taken data, taken technology and reinvented things to help the community 
through the, these really difficult uh, spring times in COVID um, and, and to help the, in the neighborhood. Markus, is there, is there anything that you and your uh, CIO function, you came across and said, wow, this is a surprising project um, that I would like to share with the audience here? Well, sure. Uh, the, we had, for instance, one big um, hackathon organized with many startups. Actually, there were over 40,000 people participating in this hackathon, sharing their ideas and projects of um, yeah, going against the virus and uh, to help people in the end. And this was just amazing. So many people were interested in presenting um, and delivering uh, technical solutions to, to all this challenges we went through and we go through and uh, we have in Germany an online access act we call it and due to this uh, act uh, we are forced uh, by the public uh, to digitize all um, public services by the end of the year 2022 and of course we prioritized um, their services right now, um, which help during the corona situation, like um, preventing um, um, the situation or giving uh, yeah, um, um, social funding um, through the internet and organizing it. And we made this happening with all of the team members within uh, just a few weeks from the idea of the solution up to the um, running system. And I think this is really encouraging and uh, something we can learn out of it. Fantastic, that's cool. Mario. Oh, oh yes, I mean, so this, this period, I think what keeps us is this emotional examples, you know, the ones that you really, when you look at them, you just say, gosh, this is amazing. And uh, within our own organizations, I'm, I'm sure Marcus and, uh, and, and all of us, I mean, we have had enormous, enormous contributions, commitment of our people. But let me refer to two small examples. Uh, one from my village in Portugal, for the ones that don't know I'm Portuguese, I live in a very, very small village, 2,000 inhabitants. And uh, when I was a young kid, I started with a lot of friends, a youth group that is still, uh, you know, um, working out in, in the village, getting people together. And suddenly I see that apart from all what they have done in the past, they realized that some kids in my village did not have access to printing the homework from the school. And here they start from one day to the other, a service that actually went much broader than the small village. And every day by the afternoon, they took their mobilettes, their bicycles, and they were distributing uh, printed versions of the homework. And I was so touched personally because, you know, it's it just it's just with the heart. It's just with the heart that people can do that. I mean, and and but obviously a bit like Marcus said. I mean, when when you think about activities that have been taking place at European level, one one good example I think, and I think that we will have opportunities to see it during the uh, discussions today in this virtual conference, is about the platform for uh, for eucovalescent plasma uh, transfusion, uh, and 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 we know uh, in. in in, in this moment where we are still searching for solutions, we know how important is plasma for people that has been affected with uh, COVID and how much it can play a very positive role for other patients. So, you know, engaging ourselves, being uh, uh, seeing all Europe, you know, united around this platform to exchange information. Uh, you know, I looked this morning again in, in this in this platform. It's it's amazing the number of people that is cooperating. So those are examples that one touches me very personally, very emotionally. The other one brings this rational and emotional thing at the same time to do something good for Europe, good for humanity. And a bit like you said, uh, Max, in the beginning, make a better world out of this crisis. Wow, that's you, cool. May, 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 yes, may I just please. add, you were talking right now about an example from your home village. I would like to add something uh, because uh, in my uh, in the school of my kids, uh, there was also this lockdown, you know, everyone had to go home and they were receiving the papers to do at home schooling. And then the kids said to the teacher, oh, why don't we do it online? Um, and the teachers were saying, hey, how, how can we do this? We will organize it for you. And they did so within two weeks 
weeks, they organized the technical setting, they teach the teachers how to do this, and after the two weeks, they were able to have their normal schedule of the school, the normal classes, and were doing all of the stuff then online. All children were online then, and I think this is an example where we can also learn a lot out of, out of it. Um, how can we transform these projects, these ideas, to a broader um, um, level and uh, to make this interoperable uh, with other um, yeah, challenges we are facing, you know? <laughs> Well, Marcus, so that's, I was that, just was thinking about it, Mario, when you were saying it. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's fantastic. That's actually back from the future. It's actually using our kids to teach us how the world is going to be and how we can profit it from right now. Very cool. But gentlemen, is this not uh, the cool thing about it? It is sort of the plumbing that we do collectively and that we make happen at the local level that drives us here today. Fantastic example. Thanks a lot for this. But could I pick up on one point um, that came out uh, about what Markus said when he referred to the online Zugang, the online access law in Germany, and that Mario referred to a little bit uh, at, at EU level. These are two major, massive initiatives and projects that are going on, challenges actually, where at EU level we have this single digital gateway regulation that at its heart has a once only a uh, project a tool that would allow citizens and businesses to access services borderless, frictionless across, across the whole of, of Europe. This would be transformational, foundational for a new connected uh, digital government setup across Europe. And Germany actually has the same with the online Zugangsgesetz, uh, the online access law that puts very clearly me as a citizen or me as a small company uh, sort of in control and command. But the back office is, work is massive. I know that the clock is a little bit ticking, but we took time in the beginning, so I think we have a bit of a moment maybe for the two of you to come in on that and see maybe one aspect that is particularly important for you as a challenge, as a cooperative aspect that you would bring on the single digital gateway and the link with the online uh, Zugangsgesetz uh, in Germany. Who starts? Mario, you start? Why not? I mean, I, I think that the single... The single digital gateway is 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 a bit like uh, like the example of Marcus with the kids. You know, you know they bring us to the future. I think that the single digital gateway, no matter how much we talk about the digitalization, the digital transformation of public administrations, is a very concrete example. It's something that we need, as we identified citizens across Europe, the mobility, the idea of a of, of, of a digital uh, single market. We need to be able to uh, facilitate online access to information, administrative procedures, get assistance, and do this in a transparent way. And uh, so this, for me, gives us a leap forward into the future, brings the once-only principle in practice. And guess what? Being here in the semi-conference, what is it really essential to achieve that? Is that we are able to have, uh, you know, at the heart of this movement, the semantic perspective, the semantic challenge to make sure that the systems, the administrative organizations and the people that we talk to in this process really understand each other. So it's it's previewing the digital uh, uh, public administration of the future is challenging us today on the semantic aspect. This means putting in the hands of all of you that are around us today, you know, a huge responsibility in the, in the sense of let's work together, let's collaborate, let's make it a reality. Marcus? Yeah, um, I, I just can add to this. Um, the German government um, just recently launched a yeah, economy support package, and it was the first time in the history of Germany that within this package um, was also the topic of um, doing the digitization of the public administration, and with a huge amount of money, I can say. And it shows already how much the needs are that we transform what we do and public administration within Germany, but also within uh, the whole of Europe. And um, we are organizing this package over this online access um, law, and uh, we have to digitize all these services. So it's, uh, I, I'm every day in a situation where we discuss, okay, how can we launch very quickly the solutions and how make we sure that we have an interoperability to, um, to the other states within Germany 
Germany, the cities, the communities, but also to the European level. Therefore, I'm glad that we have this single digital um, um, gateway right now on the way. We are implementing this right now. Of course, it's challenging. It's just a short period of time. We have to make this happening. We have to organize the resources we need to do so. But it's so much important that we have the link between these different things. Just one example, we are right now launching a German portal where everyone can have access through the internet to these digital services. And we have to link this one with um, the portal in the EU, Your Europe. And it's um, also something we have to organize through um, uh, this single digital gateway. And uh, I think we will manage this to do, and we have to do, because people don't understand why do I have to access through another way if I want a specific uh, service uh, and uh, if I'm searching for something else, I have to go through another portal. That's uh, something we have to bring together more. Markus, thank you so much. Mario, thank you so much. This is really heartwarming, seeing the two of you there ping-ponging together and actually moving hand in hand. This doesn't mean that everybody needs to do the same thing at the same time, but looking at each other and joining forces brings us forward much, much faster. And I, I love how you did this this morning, so I want to say a big, big thanks, uh, gentlemen, to the two of you for being here with us and bringing good vibes in, in this morning session. And if you allow me, maybe, maybe it's a little bit far-fetched, but uh, you said uh, you spoke both about the kids and the gaming and so on. You remember uh, the most famous plumber in the world? Uh, Mario, sorry, it's Super Mario. So I think here we have the Super Mario and we have seen that at the same time we have in Berlin the Super Marcus who is joining this, uh, the, the Super Mario for a fantastic train ride. I think now they do the kart ride and so on. But it is a bumpy ride, but it's full of adventure and it's great to see that it is full of human energy and the fun as well. Gentlemen, thanks a lot to both of you. Uh, uh, back to Berlin, uh, uh, back to Brussels, a different place. Thank you for being with us today. And uh, okay. uh, I think the community is with us, with you and behind you. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, wow. Was this a nice beginning? It was not so bad, no? But we, we thought actually during the whole day today, it would not only be sort of you start big and then you go down and then you start big up again. No, no, no. It's the same level of intensity and I hope of fun and exchange that is going on through, through the whole day. But if you allow me, uh, as we are on this plumber business that I really like a lot, you remember? Hmm? It looks a bit nasty, but it also looks like a machine that, that talks. And uh, okay, but uh, I, I put it away for the moment. We come back to it. But we are in the plumbing uh, business uh, today. And if we speak about plumbing, about maintenance and repair, uh, we think that we have the man for you. If we speak about APIs and the role, the importance of APIs, of building an, an API environment for businesses, but also for the public service. We have the man for you. And it's actually the same man. His name is Eric Wilde. I don't know whether Eric, you are, you are already here in the call. Eric, are you out there? Yes, I am. Hello, good to hear Hello. you, Eric. Good morning. Yes. Hi, you are. Hey. And you are right in the middle of the world. I see behind you the map. That's good to see you. Yeah. 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 Uh, when I was saying you are the right man for the plumbing and the right man for the APIs, I don't know whether <laughs> the audience knows, but I know it, that you did once a video that was partly filmed in the basement of your home, in the middle of the tubes and the pipes of the heating system of, of this house. I just loved it. Uh, because what you, what you said, I think you will say it yourself, but it is the importance of the hidden elements the infrastructure that is not visible, but that makes us actually comfortable, that makes the data go, that makes the heat go, that makes the, the energy, the electricity on. This hidden system is very often forgotten, but it is so essential. On the other hand, our role is not necessarily to show all of this to everybody, but just to keep it going, keep it maintained, well maintained and quickly repair it. So I don't know, Seth, my colleague Seth, he's out there, I think maybe he could post a link to this video that I really uh, loved a lot and that the audience could show, not during the speech now, but afterwards, 
quietly uh, at home. So, uh, Eric, great that you're here with us. Uh, you are actually a man who has crossed many parallel universes. Uh, you are one of the most, uh, the world leading experts in, in APIs and semantics, and we are really proud to have you with us uh, today for this talk. Um, you're also a man who crossed many, many borders and frontiers. You, you came out of Europe, we went to the US, you came back to Europe, you started in an academic environment, and then moved into business now, in fairly big business, fairly important businesses. And I hope that uh, today you are maybe also discovering the public administrations as maybe a future calling or as a new calling. I stop here. Eric, the talk is you. You audience, please uh, keep posting questions because Eric said that afterwards he will take a few questions from the audience, vote it up the ones that you like most and, most, and Eric will come back to the questions afterwards. Eric, the floor is yours. Great that you're here with us this morning. Thanks a lot, Max. That was a really, really nice introduction. And I would like to thank you and the organizers and, and I think Seth, most importantly there, who invited me to, to give a keynote at this conference. And yeah, it, it's a really nice. It, it's actually the first time I think I was introduced as a plumber, but it's, it's fine. I'll take it. I think that's, that's a good thing. Plumbing is important. And I think using good plumbing and using quality plumbing can really help you to build up more valuable stuff. And that is what I want to talk about today. A little bit about that good plumbing is important and the plumbing I talk, I'll talk about will be APIs. And as Max said, I've been working in this space for quite a while. And I always think that it's really interesting to think about what APIs really are, what they allow you to do, and that it's really important to kind of get them right. So to just give you a little bit of an introduction maybe into who I am and what I do. So my name is Erik Wilde. You can find me on Twitter. By the way, the slides are online. I posted the link to the slides in my Twitter timeline. So if you want to check out the slides online, go ahead and do that. They're interlinked. So you can just look at them in your browser and you can actually follow links, which is, I think, convenient. So you can just do stuff with the slides. So I have been working in industry for almost 10 years now. Before that, I worked in academia. I always work on large scale information systems, web technologies, web architecture. And now this was kind of a natural transition into the world of APIs. I have been doing a lot of public speaking. My role in the companies I've worked for, for the last companies always was outreach and, and helping to get the word out how to do the right things with APIs and how to do them in the right way because that is always, I work for Xway, which is a software vendor and we sell API management software. And it's very important for us that our customers actually use them well, because otherwise they will not be happy. And it's very important to do the right things because otherwise you might buy the software and the software in itself might be good, but if you're not using it in the right way and you're not doing the right things, then you won't be happy with it. So I've done a lot of public speaking. I've done a lot of traveling, which naturally these days doesn't happen anymore. So these days what I do actually, I produce a lot of videos. So if you're interested in API topics, go and check out my channel. I post pretty regularly. I try to tackle topics that people find interesting. And it's just an interesting exercise for me actually to move over a little bit into this new medium for me. The team I work with is a very small team within Xway. So there is just seven of us. We're called the catalysts. And our role really is to make sure that our customers basically do the right thing and do it in the right way. We never ever talk about products. We have enough other folks doing that. We want to tell people what in our experience are good ways to use APIs, what are successful ways to use APIs and what are the important things to keep in mind when you use APIs so that you use them in the most effective way. The topic of this event is sustainable data services. I translated that since I'm from the API space into sustainable APIs. And I thought about, okay, what does that really mean? And it's, I think not that different between companies, let's say, and public, public administrations or public services, because 
In the end, it's about the same general idea. An API is a way how you make some capability available. You allow somebody to do something. And when they think that's valuable, they will use the API. And that creates a value exchange in companies. That often means you have paying customers. In public administration, it means you make the life of your citizens better. So in both cases, you're kind of doing the same thing. You transfer some kind of value between users and providers. When you look at APIs, I, I think a very easy way to think about APIs is they're a promise. They are a promise where you say, for now, if you want to get something done, here is how you can do it, and this is how it works. And that promise is something that goes down to a technical level. You have to define the API, you have to say what the data formats look like, and so forth. But it also is something that has to be useful. It has to be valuable. So you have to think about what should I even do? What, are, what do people want to do? And then you can start building your API around it. And once again, thinking about that topic of sustainable APIs, I, I thought if you look at this basic idea of APIs as a promise, we can look at two very simple things. And these are the only things I want to talk about today. So one thing is when you make these promises, think about who you're promising something to and what that actually means, what value that promise creates. I think that is really important. We have a lot of organizations that just create APIs without thinking about why they're even doing it and who should be the ones consuming it. And I think that is one very important thing that you have to think about. The second thing that I want to talk about is thinking about not just producing APIs or publishing data or whatever it is that you're doing, but also thinking about how you can become part of a bigger picture, which is this idea of building a platform. And that is something that I think is really important and really interesting. So I will spend some time doing that. But first, let's have a brief look on what an API is. It's a promise and what a good idea is to approach this general process of let's do APIs, now what do we do? One thing that is really important for I think many organizations to keep in mind is that since an API is a promise, it also should be managed well, meaning that you make that promise, somebody takes you up on it, and then you have to keep the promise. That means you have to put resources into it. And it's important to be aware of that. Like everything else, APIs don't come for free. So you have to think about why you're doing them, how you're doing them, who you're doing them for, and also how you may stop doing them because you realize that keeping that promise now costs more resources than it creates value. So that's important as well. And that's something that I think in a lot of cases, organizations are not really quite taking as serious as they should. They just think that, well, if we have API, a lot of good things will happen. And that's kind of true, but it's only true if you manage the APIs in the right way. And in order to do that, what we do when we work with organizations who want, who want to start on their API journey, publish APIs and let's say transition towards APIs. We have a structured way of how we look at all the things that you have to consider because an API is a product, should be managed as a product, and you have to look at things such as strategy, design, documentation, development, testing, deployment, security, monitoring, discovery, change management. So all of these are considerations that you should have. And it's important to think about those because if you're not doing that, then you may spend a lot of resources creating APIs without anybody consuming them. And then they're not really valuable at all. The only reason why an API is valuable is because it is used. That's really the number one thing that you have to keep in mind. And I want to give you two very short examples of how these different facets of what matters translates into more specific exercises that we go through when we help organizations managing their APIs. So one, for example, is API design. And when you look at API design, as I said, an API 
is a promise and it's, it's also a language, meaning that an API allows two parties to cooperate to get something done and it defines how you do that by exchanging data very often. And there are different ways how you can do that. And I, I'm a firm believer that there is no single best way how to design APIs. So an API is a language, and then you can ask yourself, how do I now define and design that language? And there are different ways how you can do that. Here I'm showing you a brief outline of the languages, some of the languages that are out there. I have classified them into five different language styles. You might see some technologies that you, that you know as examples of these styles. But what I find is really important is to always understand that for the general API space, there is no single best way how to do it. Depending on the product that you want to build, there may be different ways how to solve that problem in a good way. And that depends on the people you design for, the problem you're approaching, the landscape that you're designing into. So what are other APIs looking like? And all of these are important considerations. So it really is something that is important to keep in mind that just doing APIs is really not good enough. You have to think through how you're doing it and what kind of design exercise is important for you. A second interesting observation in that product management space is versioning. I won't go into any details here, just a interesting little tweet from Roy Fielding. He's, he's, one of the, he's one of the creators of the HTTP protocol. He has been very much involved in that. So he's a really well-known figure in the web space. And what he's saying is really, when you design APIs, make sure that you keep in mind that you don't break other people's applications. And that is really important because every API is a promise and you have to keep that promise. So one of the things that's really important is to always plan for evolution. Meaning that from the very beginning, once you start doing something, think about if I wanna change this, how would I do this? And how would that affect people who already use this API? That's something that is not really, really hard, but it's something you have to plan. It's something you have to keep in mind from the very beginning. So it's an important thing to be aware of this. And like many other things, and as, as, as has been pointed out, in plumbing, it's the same thing. You have to be aware of what things you have to take into account, you have to put into the design so that if something bad happens, if you have to fix something, if you have to change something, you can do that. If you have planned for this, it often is relatively easy to fix things or to change things. If you haven't planned for it, you may have all kinds of nasty side effects that you don't want to have. So keep that in mind, always, plan for evolution. That's an important thing for APIs. That was the one thing that I wanted to talk about, just a little bit about API products, that it's important to see them as products, to design them, to think about who you're designing for, and to have a focus on, I want to make my consumers as happy as I can. The second thing that I want to talk about very briefly is this idea of building platforms. And by platform here, I mean a very specific platform. And that specific type of platform is a business model. Traditionally, business works like this, linear business models. And that is true both for goods, for physical goods and for services. So you take your starting point, which for physical goods may be raw materials, you maybe have suppliers that give you parts, you may consume some services, then you build stuff and you make it available to consumers. That's a linear value chain. The same is actually true for governments. When you think about it, a government, if you look at the organization as a government, it starts with raw goods with data. So let's say you take a data set, you collect the data set, maybe you have some other parts that go into it and then you somehow make it available for consumption and people consume it. It's the same kind of linear value chain where you say it's good that I publish data 
And it is good. And this kind of linear value chain is something that has been around for millennia and it works well. But what's interesting is to think about what also works very well nowadays that people are more and more networked. And this is the platform model, the platform business model to be more specific. The typical platform is something like eBay. So eBay doesn't really sell you stuff. eBay is just a place where you go to find somebody who sells stuff. And that is extremely valuable because otherwise it would be hard to find them. What that means is that eBay as a platform is very valuable to people because it creates these means of connection. And as we know, all these very, very valuable platform companies like Facebook, Twitter, Google, eBay, Apple, they have figured out really good ways how to enable this value transfer between different populations, between different user groups and build their business model on top of it. And I think that is something that is really interesting and that also helps a lot when you think about what you can do with APIs. Because when you look at these arrows, all these arrows are all APIs. They are all flows of information and these are enabled by APIs. In a lot of cases, when we talk to organizations and we show them this platform model, they, the, the, the initial response always says, yeah, but we're not Google. We don't want to be Google and that's fine very few organizations aspire to be Google and that's okay. But what I think is really interesting and in particular, I think in the, the case that we're looking at in today's event is that while it is very valuable to publish data and to make it available, it also could be very valuable to think about what other kinds of value might people want to exchange such as additional information, reviews, or whatever it is, additions to data. It's hard to think of these things on the spot, but I think it's really important to take that into consideration. So what you end up with then is this kind of hybrid model, which is on the one hand, still looking at the traditional idea of we produce something, maybe as a government, you produce things, but then you also start thinking about how can we also become a platform so that people can base value exchanges on our platform and there's a combination of what we do and what people contribute. So that is something where you could say this is citizen contributions and how can we build something where the data that we have plus the contributions by citizens overall produce more value for the consumers. And that I think in particular in the public space could be something really interesting to think about. And APIs play a big role there because they are the bits and pieces, they're the plumbing that move all this information around. And if you get that right, magical things can happen. And I think that is really something that is a very interesting thing to think about and a potentially very valuable thing to explore. And with that, I'm already done. What I wanted to talk about was this, what we call the API journey. So this idea of really thinking about what I want to get done with APIs, why I'm even doing it, what scenarios I think I can contribute value to and who I'm contributing that value to. I wanted to point out that it's important to manage your APIs as products to think about how you can change them so that you can improve them while you're learning what you're doing and to make sure that you always have a structure in, in place that makes sure that these products are really owned by somebody and managed by somebody. And I also wanted to briefly talk about this idea of a platform and how that might completely change, so to speak, what you want to do with APIs, where it's not just publishing data, but you really think about how can we actually provide more value? And that's not necessarily value we have to produce. We just have to connect the right places and then suddenly we can generate much more value than we could before. And with this, I'm done. Thank you very much. Once again, the slides are online. If you want to look at them, they're interlinked. You can find them at the URI that's shown here. And if you have any questions, I'll hang out in all the digital places after this 
this uh, presentation. And also, please feel free to contact me in the usual digital places. You'll find all my contact information here. Thank you very much. Well, Eric. Big, big thanks uh, to you. I think this was a fantastic opener. You have uh, me certainly totally with you. It, it sounds super convincing and it sounds so easy to do, but it is super hard. Uh, and uh, I love how you go about it. And so I, I think the, the audience has seen it also. Go and check out uh, Eric's uh, uh, YouTube channel. I did it over the last days and I really enjoyed it because it's the same good style like he did uh, today. But Eric, thank you. You said you, you are around for a few questions also now in the sessions. We have a few minutes. And um, I was trying to follow a little bit the, the, what I like here, the screen that I have here in the studio uh, has, says, greetings to colleagues from Georgia, which is fantastic. Um, and then uh, greetings to, from India, which I also love totally. Ah, but now I get the questions also exactly on, this, um, on, on your presentation. So one that I saw was, was saying, how is it that API developers don't think about semantic interoperability? Eric, would you agree with that? Uh, on what is your take on that? That's a snake pit. <laughs> it's like I, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about the semantics in my presentation, and I thought I'd rather not do it. Um, so I think that's just a question of how you define semantics, right? I mean, every API is semantic. I mean, it has meaning. Somebody thinks about what it does, and they somehow define and document that. So I think every API developer thinks about semantics. They think about how you know how can do people how can people do stuff with this api they just not don't think about it maybe in a little bit more narrow view of specific semantic technologies let's say but in practice i mean what we've seen so far is just that in in industry even though some companies are using semantic technologies at times, in most cases, it's just the uptake is just not there. So if we if we if we look at the, the more narrow view of semantics as using technologies that have the semantic label on them, then um, that's true. That's just a fact, I think, of companies not having considered them so far. But apart from that, I think everybody is using semantics all the time. Otherwise, APIs wouldn't work. I think this was a very uh, wise uh, snake pit uh, uh, positioning, but, but very true. I, I agree with you. We, I, we see another question here from Sander, uh, well-known uh, guy out there on the topic, who's, whose uh, question got voted up quite a lot. And where Sander asks, uh, could you explain why, uh, how you see the relation between data and APIs? You, how you see the relation between data and APIs. For instance, the relation between data governance, the evolution of models, and API governance. And I think this governance issue came in also in, in a number of other, other questions. Another snake pit. Eric, what do you think? <laughs> it's, it's funny, actually, because all the questions are great. These are all the questions where I removed all the slides because I didn't want to get into the snake pits. So my view on APIs versus data is that APIs are a superset of data. So data is kind of just information at rest and um, not the technical rest, you know, at rest, <laughs> resting information, let's put it like this. And APIs are a way how to interact with certain capabilities. So I think if you look at APIs in many cases, the difference there is that APIs have specific interaction models where the idea really is if to interact with a service or even with a data service, you don't just blankly, it's not a database. It's not like you just you know, get data and put data, but there are specific interactions, how you update that data source or that service. And those interactions may look very different from the data that is actually stored, for example, by the service. And in some cases, that difference might not be very big when it's really about sort of interacting with data sets. But in other, and, and, and I mean, in most real life scenarios, I would say that difference is very big because when I, for example, when I order something and I go to a website, I go to Amazon and order, then the information that I enter in there, let's say API, where I put in the product information and where to ship it to and whatever, that's a very different information than what ends up in their databases, right? So, and I have no idea what their database looks like. And I, 
and they don't want me to have any idea and probably I wouldn't understand it because it's probably much more sophisticated than what I need to do. So I think the main difference there is that in APIs you specifically design interactions and you design them to make things as easy as possible. And if you look more at purely data oriented interactions or data oriented APIs, then you don't really design the interactions that specifically, which can make things just harder to use. But, but none of them can live with the other one, which I like out of your, which I hear out of your message. Sure. I mean, at the end, right? I mean, pretty exactly. much every API will have some data store behind it. But in most cases, you will not know what that looks like and you don't want to know, frankly. Uh, that's the value creation. No, I, I like it a lot. I, I got one question here that I thought was quite interesting, uh, more uh, organizational that came in here. If I can read it quickly and then I think we need to move out. But uh, if you bear with us for, for two minutes. Sure. Uh, the question was, how can public administrations find the right spot, the right balance between developing in-house API competencies, like ensuring good quality documentation over time, etc., and that's the one thing in-house, and then the other side, the balance needed outsourcing specific developments uh, to external contractors who might work quicker and for some organizations cost less. So what should be the tasks uh, that we rather should keep in-house, in particular when we speak about public administrations, um, and uh, uh, which ones could be more easily externalized? Long question, sorry, but quite hands-on. Balance between outsourcing and keeping stuff in-house. It, yeah, it's another great question, I think. And we see that actually also a lot of in, in companies, right? Like some companies, actually a fair bit of them, they just contract it out to Accenture or, you know, like the usual suspects. And that, that, that works. But I think sometimes what doesn't work well is that they don't think enough about what do we even want to have out of these APIs and how important are these APIs for us as an organization. So what I typically see is that the more sophisticated an organization becomes in terms of thinking about digitalization or digital transformation, whatever you want to call it, the more they in-house these things because they realize that these are our core things that we need to own. We can't just outsource this and say, yeah, somebody else should do the APIs. We don't really, you know, we, like, we take the cheapest offer and just have them develop. So it's really, in my mind, it's important that you think about why you even do it. And even if you choose to outsource certain things that you try to really work hard on defining where the value is in APIs and then making that part of your outsourcing arrangement. So one really bad anti-pattern that we've seen is that this outsourcing then gets you to this API factory where basically the contract is, you know, we pay you by API. Yeah. And then like that external company just churns out API without really thinking about are they useful? Will everybody, anybody ever use them? And that's, that's just a dynamic that you don't want to have. So really think about why you're even doing it. And when you, when you choose to outsource certain things, at least make sure that you have indicators that allow you to understand whether you get the APIs that you think will actually produce value. I think that really is like focus on the value, th focus on who you're building the APIs for. And then I think you have a good starting point to better control what's happening if you choose to, to do some outsourcing. Cool, totally with you on that. This for me is also very much the, the maintenance paradigm that I hear uh, out of that. Eric, thanks a lot uh, for, for this chat in the morning, I, uh, uh, for your presentation, for your inspiration, for the, the time you took discussing with us and showing your doubts and explaining so, so clearly the, the, the ideas behind how the plumbing works in the background and then saying it so clearly. I noted a few points, uh, if I can read my own handwriting, that I liked a lot uh, during the, your, the, the talk now. API is a responsible promise. I will use this a lot, honestly, promised. Um, the, uh, we, you, API data people, semantic people, interoperability people are actually transfer agents for value. I like that also a lot. I will use it a lot. Distributed problem solving is for, for me wired in what we are discussing today and that we have to plan, and this was also the last point, uh, what you just said, plan for evolution. 
And finally, something that I think uh, rings, uh, you want to see my notes? Uh, it's unreadable, I have to admit. Uh, that uh, we have to plan for evolution and that we see government as a platform. And I know that I think this is something that rings very well with what uh, Markus and, and uh, Mario said before and something that drives this community of CIOs uh, around. So I'm, I'm very happy uh, about this confirmation from, from your side. Um, Eric, thanks. Um, I, I don't know whether you were there before, but we said at the beginning that we need to write tools. And uh, you told me that you are a, a big fan of fixing stuff in your house, in particular the heating and the plumbing. So we used this in the beginning to illustrate a bit. But um, actually, I, I, we are not here physically now, so I can't give it to you. But I have a second tool, I come closer, that is actually quite, quite useful. This is actually a dedicated heating plumbers tool that I got once at an event and that I would like next time when we meet, uh, hand over to you to, to pass the baton. It also has a very useful function because you can open bottles uh, with it. So maybe we can there combine the two. Next time it's yours, okay? Eric, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it a lot, thanks. And uh, you, uh, uh, friends, people, semi-community out there, you heard that uh, Eric is hanging out in the usual digital places, so you can <laughs> contact him there and continue the conversation. Um, we are now at 11.12, I think, uh, if the clock in the studio is right, because actually the clock says we are on the 15th of October 2021. So we are actually beyond COVID, I hope, and we could do it physically, but uh, so I'm not entirely sure how reassured I can be there. But... Um, this is the end of the, uh, no, it's not the end. It's, it's only the end of the opening plenary session, but it is certainly not the end of the SEMIC 2020 communi uh, community uh, adventure. And I hope that you bear with us, that you stay with us, that you stick with us during the day. Um, we will now go into, after maybe five minutes break, somehow, I don't know, nobody nods, nobody says anything, just a few minutes of break. 10 minutes, they say, okay, you have to fold 10 minutes before we go into the um, breakout session and the parallel tracks. Um, so the plumbing will continue. The plumbing will continue in smaller groups. Please do ask your questions in Slido within your groups. Uh, keep the sleeves up, uh, listen to, to best practice cases, use cases, experiences on the ground. We very much go into the, the member states, into the city, into the local level experiences in sectors like health and so on that we have seen. So stay with us, um, tweet, ask questions, keep the good spirit up despite uh, this bloody COVID stuff happening outside. Um, and uh, after this session that ends at 12.15, we will go in a, in a general break and uh, you network, you eat, you have the 10th coffee of the day, but you are back please at two o'clock when we meet again for the plenary session. So uh, the plumbing continues, stay with us um, uh, now for the breakout sessions and then for the plenary. Uh, now you have eight minutes because I kept on talking, which is not fair of myself. Um, you can do what my former boss, uh, Andros, uh, always said. Uh, this is the moment where you can grab something to eat, uh, grab something to drink, uh, go to the loo or whatever you do, but just don't fall asleep and come back for the parallel tracks. You find them in your program. Just click on them, join them, and have fun during the parallel tracks. Cheers. See you later. <laughs>